that everything God does, he does well. As a matter of fact, if you need convincing of that, all you need is a mirror. Take a good look. You ought to be convinced that God does things well. As we set off to receive a word for this first worship weekend of 2013, I want to invite you to journey with me to the book of 2 Samuel in the Old Testament. And I would ask that you join with me in the last chapter of the book of 2 Samuel. That would be chapter 24. And I want to read some of the concluding verses of 2 Samuel, chapter 24, of the New King James Version of the Bible, beginning in verse number 18. 2 Samuel chapter 24, beginning in verse number 18. The word of the Lord declares, And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Aruna went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Yeah. Then Aruna said, Why has the Lord, the king, come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Yeah. Now Aruna said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look. Here are oxen for the burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Aruna has given to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Aruna, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Yeah. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Look at verse number 24. But David said, I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, I've got to do better. You may be seated in the presence of God. I've got to do better. Allow me, for the sake of brevity and for the cause of Sunday school, to skip the formal introduction of the sermon and get right into the heart of the matter of what the Lord has placed on me and try to put a bow on this sermon in the next 20 to 25 minutes. The life of David is one of the most intriguing and interesting stories in all of scripture. We're introduced to a young David, unknown, unheralded, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, from which our New Year's Eve word came. And for all intents and purposes, the last episode of David is recorded in 2 Samuel 24. For you will find that when the sun rises in the book of 1 Kings, that we find an aged and an elderly David who's ready to pass on his kingdom to his son Solomon. What we read, however, in 2 Samuel chapter 24 is, without a shadow of a doubt, in my mind, one of the most poignant, pregnant, and prophetic words to speak to us as we begin our journey into this new year. What goes down in 2 Samuel 24 may be unfamiliar to many of us, Allow me to briefly set the context that you might appreciate the content of God's word to you on today. Right. In 2 Samuel 24, David is moved and motivated to have a census. He wants to take count of all the men and women of Israel to know who's in the land. And even though his chief of staff, Joab, and his military commanders advise against it, David uses the authority of the monarch to force the census and to have the men of Israel counted. The Bible says that they went out and counted, and nine months and 20 days later, they came back with a report to David that there were 800,000 abled bodied men in Judah, 500,000 abled bodied men in Israel, comprising 1.3 possible soldiers in the land. Okay. 
When the report of the census comes back, David is deeply grieved and recognized that he has made a grievous error in the sight of God. That in acting the census and counting the people, David realizes he has sinned. And God confirms his displeasure when the Lord shows up and his wrath is kindled against David for taking the census. God is none the too happy with David to know that David has gone out without divine commandment to take account of the men of Israel. Now, somebody right on the onset, you ought to be asking a real good question, and that is this. Why would God be upset over a census? Why would God be disappointed and displeased with David simply because David counted the people of the land? Well, it could be on the first hand that when they counted the people of the land, it caused confusion. You'll understand that whenever people are counted by the government, there's always a little anxiety about what the count's going to be used for. As a matter of fact, you only need to look at the latest U.S. census and realize that about 30% of American citizens did not want to participate for fear that participation would lead to uh, information to immigration services or your taxes going up, which was going to happen anyway. Uh, so there were those in the land who were confused about the cause and believed that the undercurrent of why David took the census was either there was going to be an induction into the military or taxes were going to be raised. All right. Second reason that they might have been displeased, that God was upset about it, is not only that it caused confusion, but it discounted the disabled. For if you read how the census went down, they only counted the men who could stand strong on their legs, hold a sword, and look like soldiers. And I want to tell you that there's always danger when you discount folk who don't stand like you stand and look like you look and walk like you look. Don't ever discount a life simply because its resume doesn't add up to your resume. There's value in the lives of God's people. And God is upset thirdly because they now are beginning to operate like their opposition for you will find the taking of a census was a political move that was not indigenous to the people of Israel, but it was rather what was done by those of the Amalekites and the Canaanites and the Amorites. And when David uses the census, he allows Israel to begin to look like its enemies and its neighbors. And I come by to tell you that there's always danger when the children of light start to look like children of darkness. You've got to understand that when God is moving in your life, you cannot be camouflaged. You cannot blame blend in. You cannot mix in. Baby girl, you ought to stick out like a sore thumb on your job because when you really love the Lord and you walk by faith and not by sight and you trust God with everything, you become a peculiar people that does not mimic the ways of people around you. No, oh, but finally, God is most displeased because by counting the people, David shows a desire to rely on his resources. David wants to count who he's got so he can figure who he can count on. Right. And the word of the Lord that comes back is really this. How dare you count up who's in your life and feel that that's the reason you will get whatever you've got to get and go wherever you've got to go. Don't you know you didn't make it this far because of who you got and who you don't have. The only reason you made it this far is because I'm God all by myself. And you've got to know that me and you is greater than anything that can stand against you. How dare you trust in men? How dare you trust in degrees? How dare you trust in money? How dare you trust in affili affiliations? How dare you trust in associations? You've got to learn to trust in God. And the displeasure of God is that the census indicated that David did not trust in the Lord. And so God shows up. And in one of the most unique passages of scripture, God tells David, I'm going to let you choose your punishment. It's, it's kind of like mama asking you to choose between the whip and the belt. Comes out and says, listen, you, you got three choices. A, you can have three years of famine. Yeah. B, you can have three months of your enemies ruling over you. Right. Or C, you can have three days of a plague. Don't, don't miss this. It's multiple choice. You got three choices. Three years of famine. Three months of your enemy ruling over you. Or three days of a plague. I want you to see the wisdom in David's answer. David says, well, Lord, don't subject me to my enemies. 
Because I've learned I can't trust men. It says, but I won't tell you what to do. Here's what I'm going to do. God, I surrender to whatever your judgment is. Because I know that when I'm in the hand of God, even when you're displeased with me, David says, I know your mercy endures forever. I might have done wrong. I may not be what I should be, but I throw myself in the hands of a merciful God. And the Bible says that God sends a plague over Israel that claims 70,000 lives. And when the angel who's in charge of the plague finds himself at the border and the boundary of Jerusalem, getting ready to go into the holy city and destroy everything, the Bible says, watch this, that God shows up and God says, that's enough. And the plague is stopped because God says that's enough. The devastation that was going to take out the whole nation is brought to an end because God said that's enough. I, I wish I had some shouting folk who understand that no matter how bad it could be and should be, all it takes is a word from the omnipotent, sovereign God to say that's enough. And what should have happened doesn't happen. What could have happened won't happen when God says that's enough. God then tells the prophet Gad, go tell David to build me an altar and worship me at the place where the plague stopped. The plague stopped on the property of a man named Aruna. So David, the king of Israel, goes to the house of Aruna. Now you gotta know the king of Israel doesn't make house calls. So when the king starts coming your way, obviously there's some anxiety about why he's there. Aruna sees David coming and realizes that this ain't just some brother from down the street. This is the king of Israel. Aruna gets nervous and asks David, why are you here? David said, I've come to buy your property so I can build an altar to the Lord. And then Aruna does what all of us live to have. He, he realizes it's David. David is the king of Israel. David wants to buy his property. And Aruna gives David what all of us want in life, a hookup. <laughs> he said, listen, David, you're the king of Israel. You don't have to buy it. I'll give it to you for nothing. My brothers and my sisters, isn't it nice when folk recognize who you are? and tell you you don't have to stand in line like everybody else and you don't have to pay full price. Don't you like it when folk recognize your face and know that you're the pastor of the Alfred Street Baptist Church and they tell you to come on, get in front of them and they'll pay the, it's always nice to get a hook up. Nudge your neighbor, tell them, hook your pastor up. Hook your, hook your pastor up. Hook your pastor up. He gives him a hook up. He said, listen, listen, you don't have to pay for any of it. I'll give it to you for free. And this is what David says, where I want you to hang your hat. He says, no, because I cannot offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. How can I bless God with something that required nothing of me? Now, let me tell you why someone needs to hear that, verse 24. Because you know, as you look back over 2012, you had some David moments where, if the truth be told, you didn't really trust God like you should have. Go on, tell the truth. There are moments in your life when you did not put your whole faith and trust 
in God and allow God. You tried to manipulate the situation. You tried to work it out based on your own will. You tried to handle every problem, deal with every jive turkey in your life. You tried to make it up the ladder by yourself. You worried because you took a census of your life and you found out that what you had, it fell way short of what you needed. And rather than trusting God, you worried about it. You tried to handle it. You tried to manipulate. You tried to break favor of your own. You tried to handle your own life and you didn't trust God. Somebody else, you had to go through the last year to find out that ultimately your life was always in the hands of God. Praise God, you were not subject to your co-workers. Praise God, your supervisor didn't have the last word. Praise God, your enemies were not in control of your life. But somebody knows that you're here on this Sunday of 2013 because your life was in the hand of God. Can I push it? And everything that should have happened didn't happen because at some moment of 2012, God said, that's enough. Uh, you had some bad things go down, but God said, that's enough. You lost some loved ones along the way, but somewhere God said, that's enough. You didn't get everything you wanted to have and bad things were going down, but God looked over the scope of your life and said, that's enough. All right, so now here you are. On the first Sunday of 2013, and you ought to be able to say like David, I will not give the Lord that which costs me nothing. God's done too much. God's been too good. God's made too many ways. God's held back too many things. For me to now walk into this new year and simply offer God the same stuff I gave him last year that requires no sacrifice. Somebody say the word sacrifice. I know for some of you all that word has no meaning. For others, it's a four letter word. Because we live in a world where the word sacrifice doesn't really resonate with us. We know accumulate. But we don't know sacrifice. And here's what David says. If it would have any value to God, it must have sacrifice from me. That I cannot honor God with anything from my life that doesn't require a sacrifice. David says, I've got to give God my best. So on this first Sunday of 2013, I came by to ask you a reflective, contemporary, uh, contemplative question. It's this. Are you giving God your best or your rest? Are you living sacrificially or are you living selfishly? Does God get your first fruits or does God get your leftovers? And whatever agenda you set for your life in 2013... Might I challenge you to do better in your walk with God yeah. in four areas. Four areas where you know you've got to do. Somebody say, I've got to do better. <laughs> you've got to do better, number one, in the time you give God. I've got to do better in the time that I give to the Lord. Let me tell you something, my brother and my sister, in, in, in this congregation. Your most valuable possession of life is not what you drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your most valuable possession is not where you live. Your most valuable possession is not your boo. I know he thinks so. Your most valuable possession are not your children. Your most valuable possession is time. Another day. Another moment of life. Another year that God has blessed you with. And let me tell you why that's your most valuable gift. Because you can't make it yourself. You can't buy it. You can't fabricate it. You don't know enough people to make certain that tomorrow will come. Now let me tell you that, that when you're under 25, you don't really appreciate the value of a new day. Because under 25, you think tomorrow's always supposed to come. Oh, but let a few years creep up on you. Let some things start to ache that didn't ache before. Let the stuff that used to live upstairs move downstairs. 
<laughs> You'll catch that later. <laughs> Let some sickness knock on the door of your life. Let some loved ones go home to glory. Let you find yourself laid out on a bed of affliction and you will wake up and understand what the psalmist meant when he said, this is the day that the Lord has made. It's not just meant to make you shout. It's meant to make you remember that if a day dawns in your life, you didn't have anything to do with it, that you can't make the sunrise. You can't make your eyes open. You can't get up of your own power. Somebody here has enough good sense to know that if the day dawns and your eyes open, and you sit up in your bed that there's but one person who ought to be thanked and given glory for the day that you have and that is God. Yeah. That if I have time, that is the most valuable gift that God can give me. And if it's the most valuable gift that God gives you, then it's the most precious gift you can give back to God is your time. I can prove it to you because the number one attack of the enemy against those who are walking in faith is not temptation to evil. H hear me, hear me, brother, sister. At some point in your walk with God, there ought to be some things that just don't tempt you because you're growing. And the stuff that tempted you when you were not in the body of Christ should no longer even be desirous to you as you grow in the body of Christ. So the enemy's number one attack is not the temptation to evil. The number one attack of the enemy in the life of the body of Christ is busyness. So that if you stay busy, you don't have enough time to sit with God. I know the church I'm preaching at because we have made busyness and importance synonymous. So you feel the busier you are, the more important you are. You can't even sit in church without checking your email. Because you're busy. It's Sunday. The office is closed. You can't do nothing about it anyway. But you're so important. The devil keeps us busy. That's what Jesus has to get across to Martha when he goes to visit Mary and Martha. And he goes there and Mary is sitting down at the feet of Jesus, spending time with the Lord. And Martha, she's not doing evil things. She's just busy. She's trying to get the turkey out the oven. She's trying to mop the floor. She's trying to clean the house. She's trying to take care of the garden. She is busy. And Jesus looks at her and says, Martha, you're too busy. Nudge your neighbor and tell him you're too busy. And you can't give time to God staying busy. If God gave some of us an eighth day, we'd find a way to fill it up. We stay busy. My therapist in one of my recent sessions had me do an exercise I want to pass on to you. And let me pause and tell you, I have no shame in telling you that I see a therapist. I pass a black folk. I need a therapist. You need one too. So here's what she had me do. She had me sit down and we mapped out my week and looked at what I do every day and how much time I spend. And two glaring things came up. Number one, I don't rest. And number two, God does not get enough of my time. That from the moment I open my eyes to the time I go to sleep, I'm busy. Maybe that's why God created the Sabbath day. Yeah. Not for us to argue about what day of the week it is. Is it Saturday? Is it Sunday? Is it that? No that you might have a time where you stop working, stop being busy, take off your important title, sit down in the presence of God, 
and give God a full day of your life. I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I have a Sabbath? Do you have a day where you rest and you give God your best? I want you to give God more quantity of time. Start sacrificing some things in your schedule. Sacrifice 30 minutes in the morning. Get up half hour earlier to pray. Sacrifice those reality TV shows that don't teach you anything anyway. Sacrifice all that time you spend on social media. Sacrifice the lunch you have every Friday with your best friend and have some time with Jesus. Sacrifice that round of golf. Well... Sacrifice whatever plans you had for 1.30 this afternoon and just <laughs> come on, sit with us who ain't got nothing to do. <laughs> Give God more. Oh, it's at 4 o'clock? <laughs> Join us at 4 o'clock for, for prayer here in the church. Sacrifice and give God some time. Do better in the time you give to God. Number two, I want you to do better in the treasure you release to God. The one of the areas where God judges my life is in what I do with my treasures, my money. If time is your most valuable possession, money is your most valued possession. And I want you to understand that money is God's number one competitor for the devotion of your heart. Money is God's number one competitor for the devotion of your heart. That's why when you search through scripture, you'll find that the Bible teaches more about money than any other singular subject that you deal with in life because God knows that there's a temptation, the desire to put treasures, riches, wealth, and money above our devotion and our dedication to him. That's why he tells us that you can't serve two masters. Money and God is, are mutually exclusive, either or. That's why he says it's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God because folk don't like to give up their money. That's why he tells us that the root of all evil begins with the love of money. That's why he tells us in the book of Haggai that if your personal finances are messed up and it seems like you work hard but can't earn anything, God says look at how you're giving to the body of Christ and it is your failure to give correctly that causes the rippling effect of your personal financial chaos. How are you handling your finances. And what the Lord says in this is that really the reason you ought to give is because you're grateful and you trust me. God requires the sacrifice of our tithes and our offerings not because the Lord needs the money. Trust me, God is not going over the fiscal cliff. All right. All right. But God says your tithe is bona fide. Every time you tithe, you're making a declaration to the heavens that I trust God more than I trust my money. And that's why God desires it. And as you grow, you give not because of gimmicks, not because of guilt, and not even because you believe in the vision of your church. Hear me, and I've got to say this while I have a moment, because there are some people who will come and join a church And when they are in disagreement with the direction, the policies, or the processes, they rebel by withholding their tithe as if somehow that's making a statement to hurt the body of Christ. Baby, let me tell you something. Your tithe ain't so big that God can't do what God wants to do even if you don't give it. And the appropriate thing to do when you are not in line with the policies, the procedure, or the process of a church is to not sit in the pew in rebellion and disobedience and not give, but rather remove your membership and find you a church whose policy, procedures, and process you do support. Because if you are a member of the church, you ought to give not because of a vision, but you give because you are under commandment of God to bring your tithe into the storehouse. And I give because I'm grateful for what God has done in my life. Go on, preach, Pastor. 
when folk feel that the vision is all on them, I dare you to die. We'll have your funeral. We'll take you down to Mount Comfort. We'll bury you. We'll cry. We'll come back here, eat some fried chicken, green beans, and potatoes. And next Sunday, we'll be right back in this place declaring this is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. You give because it's what God commands you to do. And I'm grateful for what God has done in my life. Somebody say, I got to do better. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do two things for me in your doing better in the treasure you release to God. The first thing I want you to do, I want you to do it because it will never be done in this church. I want you to know what I'm about to give The exercise I'm about to give you will never be voted on by any governing body of this church. So here's what I want you to do personally since we will never do it publicly. I want you to take your W-2. Line it up with your giving statement from the Alfred Street Baptist Church and ask yourself, does my giving adequately reflect my blessing? We'll never do it, but I want you to take your W-2 and your giving statement not from what you gave to civic organizations, not the return checks you gave from community foundations, not what you gave to social service agencies, but what you gave to the body of Christ to which you belong. And ask, does this match what God has given me? And if your giving is not an accurate tithing reflection of your blessing, I want you to give an account to God as to why. If your giving is way fall short of your blessing, go ahead and show God them shoes with the red bottoms. <laughs> go ahead and put your Mercedes keys on the altar. And let the truth be told that those things were more important than being faithful in your giving. Wow. Wow. The second thing I want you to do this year is to start making sacrifices simply because you want to prove your love to the Lord. That there's some things you could afford to do that you're not going to do because you're going to give above your tithe. I know people don't like hearing this, but if you look in the New Testament version of, of, of giving, tithing is really not anything to brag and boast on. Tithing, Marcy, is really getting a D plus in school. You barely passed that my offerings of my gratitude show my sacrifice. The tithe belongs to God. Doing that is what you're supposed to do. But when I give above and beyond and I sacrifice some red bottoms and I sacrifice some new car keys, that's how God is honored. Because I cannot give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. And some of us have been so well blessed that your tithe doesn't cost you anything. You can give that easily. Do better in the time you give to God. Do better in the treasure you release to God. And number three, I want you to do better in the talent you use for God. Yeah. Wow. I, real quick, somebody say amen. Because there ain't going to be too many more throughout the rest of this point. So I just want to hear it up front. <laughs> the talent you use for God. Everyone in here, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, Two things happen. Immediately, the Holy Spirit entered your life. And immediately, the Holy Spirit placed a gift in you. Everyone in here is gifted. Everyone in here is gifted. And God gives you those gifts for two reasons. Number one, that you might prosper in the world. Here's what the Lord says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8. I give you the power to get wealth. That the Lord favors us and gives us talents and gifts so that we can earn a living in life. Number two, you are gifted to use those gifts as a blessing in the body of Christ Jesus. You are gifted not simply to earn money, but you are gifted to use your gifts in the body of Christ, in the church in which you belong. Now, let me tell you why it's about to get real quiet, because that's an indictment over the 80% of church members who don't do anything. 
who simply come and sit and worship. Gifted and doing nothing. You don't give any of your talents to the body of Christ. You just come and soak up worship and leave. I said it. And I know what someone's saying, Reverend, Reverend, hold on, hold on, hold on. Reverend, that, that's not fair, cuz I got a lot going on in life. I got the kids, I got the school, I'm going back, uh, trying to get another degree, I'm, I'm working, and the kids got practice. And you know, it's hard to get, it's, it's a hassle to get to Alfred Street for these ministry meetings. It's a, it's a hassle. The kids get out of school at three, got to get them home and fed and do their homework. Then we got to go to practice and then to try to get to school. I got to fight through the traffic. You know what the traffic is like on the Beltway. It's a mess on some evenings. And then when I get here, it's hard to drive around and find a parking space because you can't park on Alfred Street on the weekdays. And then everything is just so jam packed. It's hard to get here. It's a hassle. Yes, it is. And that's exactly the point. Because sacrifice is not convenient. Sacrifice is not comfortable. Sacrifice is not because I was passing by. Sacrifice says that I'm going to honor God by changing my schedule. I'm going to honor God by fighting through the traffic. I'm going to honor God by driving around one more time to find another space. I'm going to honor God by dealing with the mess of church and church folk because God has gifted me with something and I can't let the frustration of traffic, I can't let the dilemma of parking, I can't let the messiness of church policy keep me from utilizing the gift that God has given me for the building of his kingdom here on earth. You're too gifted not to make the sacrifice. And what people need to realize is that sacrifice is its own reward. Wow. Wow. We've been blessed. God, God has multiplied this congregation. We've more than doubled in every statistical number in the last four to five years. To God be the glory for all the great things he's given us. Yeah. We are operating now at a level we could never have imagined. But Trustee McNeil, I am convinced and convicted as shepherd of this church family, whoever's phone that is, shut that off. I am convinced and convicted as shepherd of this church that too often we wind up paying for what should be sacrificially given. That we pay folk to use gifts God has given them that they ought to sacrifice and give back freely to the Lord. There's something fundamentally wrong with God gifting you and then the church have to compensate you to use that gift. Especially when the Lord has allowed you gainful employment outside the church. Hear me, my brothers and my sisters. The motivation for ministry should not be earning money. And if you can't do it without getting compensated for it, then you're really not honoring God through it. God is looking for a heart that says, I would do it if I got nothing for it. I would volunteer if nobody recognized me. I would serve if they never gave me a plaque, if they never called my name, if they never gave me a check. Why? Because I understand that there's a greater reward coming that the church cannot give me when I stand before the altar of God in just judgment of my gift and the Lord looks at me and says well done thou good and faithful servant you did it for the glory of God and there has to be a new season in this church where your heart is motivated to give your talents freely to God and not want to sit down and negotiate how much you're going to get paid for it When you get frustrated about that, there's some folk I want to show you. I want to show you some Sunday school teachers who work 40 hours a week and still prepare their lessons and show up every Sunday and volunteer their time to teach you the word of God. I want to show you some Awana volunteers 
who miss Bible study every Tuesday night that they might be committed to the lives of children, teaching them the Word of God. I want to show you a count team that sits in the back of church till 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, counting up money that we might handle things correctly. I want to show you ushers who deal with you and your bad attitude and not wanting to scoot over when they tell you to scoot over and give of themselves every week. I want to show you trustees who work a half-time job at the church, showing up every day to do the work of ministry and get nothing. Because we give of our treasures, our time, and our talent freely to the Lord. Just sit on down for this leg, make me sit down. <laughs> do better in the time you give to God, the treasures you release to God, the talents you use for God. And finally, I want you to do better in the testimony you share about God. Here, this one's so simple. God's done too much for you to be quiet about it. God has answered too many prayers, made too many ways, brought you to, through too many things for you not to allow other folk around you to know how good God has been to you. Here's what God tells the children of Israel. Tell your children and your children's children about the God that brought you through the wilderness. Don't let nobody eat at your table and they don't know how good God has been to you. Don't let somebody wake up under your roof and they don't know your story of how the Lord made ways in your life. Don't work with somebody every day and they not know how good God has been to you when you know how good God has been and the ways that the Lord has made and the prayers that God has answered. You ought to freely share your testimony testimony with somebody about the God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. I've got a God who makes ways in the wilderness. I've got a God who puts rivers in the desert. I've got a God who shows up at Johns Hopkins. I've got a God who shows up in the penitentiary. I've got a God who's been good. One of the greatest gifts you can leave this life is a legacy of faith that somebody believed in God because of you. Watch what happens in the Bible. I always want this to be the most biblically educated congregation I've known in the history of Christianity. So let me teach you Bible real quick. Where David builds the altar on the threshing floor of Aruna is eventually the same site where the temple yes. will be built. Yes. What David does there paves the way yes. for thousands to worship God. Yes. That we have a testimony of God's goodness that paves the way for our children and our children's children, our coworkers, to worship God because of us. Somebody say, I've got to do better. Do better in your time, do better in your treasures, do better in your talents, and do better in your testimony. Pray with me, church. You've brought us too far to give you that which costs us nothing. Within my heart, oh God, I make a commitment to do and give you better. Not cheap, not easy, not convenient, but that which is a sacrifice and costs me something. My time that you've given to me, God, I sacrifice the other agenda items to give it back to you. The treasures that you've blessed me with, I sacrifice them to give and to prove that I trust you. The talents you've given me, I give them back to you freely to be used in your kingdom. The testimony of your goodness I shared with this world that I might leave a legacy of faith that others may worship you as I have. Yes, Lord. This is my commitment and my covenant in this new year and for the rest of my life. I'm going to do better. In Jesus' name.